Um, so we are going to have three talks, and um, uh, this is the first one, uh, Reconfigurable Digital ADCs for Highly Scaled CMOS. And um, this morning, I presented um, the work that led up to this. And now I'm, now I'm going to present the, um, uh, the work that we've done for the UC Discovery Project um, with CWC. Uh, my my uh, student on this is Jerry Taylor, and he is uh, stressing out trying to get his thesis uh, ready to um, uh, submit so he can graduate. So he asked me to do this talk for him. So just so, um, uh, so I know how much de detail to go into the background, how many people were not here for my talk this morning? So how many people were not here? Okay. So just a few of you. So you guys are out of luck. Um, so I, I'll, give you a, I'll, I'll give you a very brief motivation to, de, to describe the background, and then I'll, I'll uh, um, which hopefully will suffice to make it make sense. So this is a slide I presented this morning. It's um, basically our goal is to build A to D converters, very high, high performance, uh, low area A to D converters that are essentially digital in nature, so that they can be implemented on a. Um, so that they can be implemented on a, uh, in a CMOS process that has no enhancements for analog and that can be scaled um, essentially as easily as digital can be scaled. So, so while 65 nanometers is sort of the current sweet spot or end of the road, and some, some would say for high performance analog, our goal is to make it so that to make ADCs that actually get better as we shrink to smaller feature sizes. And so the motivation for this project was to get to build ADCs. Um, that basically compete with continuous time delta sigma ADCs that don't have any of these high performance blocks. And that's because as CMOS technology scales, they get really, really hard to do. But, um, but CMOS technology, as it scales, offers extremely fast, dense, and low power digital circuitry, so that's what we want to make use of for analog performance. And so what I'm going to show you today is the um, work we've done to ge generate, to develop the second generation version of these ADCs. Okay, so I showed the first generation version um, uh, this morning. And just to remind you, our ADC, uh, our entire ADC looked like this. Okay, so this looks very complicated, but it occupies 0.07 millimeters squared of silicon so in a 65 nanometer process, and that will actually shrink when you go below um, 65 nanometers. So it, it's complicated to look at, but not, to, um, not, not in terms of area. So the, the bottom line is, is we, have, we have two paths, signal paths, with a voltage, two, two differential voltage to current converters. Then we have um, four 15 element current controlled ring oscillators, and then everything else is digital after that. And we put in dither positively and negatively, and we rely on it getting canceled. And this would be a horribly nonlinear system, except we have a, a background calibration unit that's constantly running on the chip that um, uh, loads these high-speed lookup tables, which are running in our new case at 2.4 gigasamples per second. Um, uh, they're constantly being loaded every few hundred milliseconds with new uh, nonlinearity coefficients that have been measured. So the first generation had some limitations. Um, it, it achieved very high performance um, and was, was very small, but everything can be improved. And one of the warts um, on, our, on our system was that we had to use a 2.5 volt V to I converter, voltage to current convo converter. And that was essentially our only analog component in the system. And what we, want to do, what we wanted to do with, the, with this generation is to eliminate that. So we did that. And also, we couldn't afford to go to pay for, for um, silicon that um, was lower than 65 nanometers. And, and we were limited by how fast we can push signals through an inverter. That is, how, what's the delay through an inverter? And um, so we needed a workaround for that. And so um, we, we developed that as well. So our, our improvements were injection locked VCOs to reduce quantization noise. We used a faster version of the 65 nanometer process, the G plus process, instead of the LP process, to reduce digital power. We, we got rid of the, um, uh, the op amp based V to I converter, and we, we came up with a number of other uh, improvements, which I'll talk about briefly, to improve performance. So the first generation I, I see is limited by quantization noise, which is never desirable in an ADC. In an ADC, you'd always like to be limited by thermal noise because that's, the, um, um, that's what you pay the most for in terms of power consumption. 
Um, in our case, whoops, didn't mean to do that. In our case, um, our quantization noise is set by the minimum delay through an inverter, and we'll call it tau. And we used 15 element ring oscillators. So our, our tau was 30 picoseconds, which gave us a center frequency of, of 1.15 giga, uh, gigahertz. And our, um, uh, our each, each um, inverter, in fact, I'll use my pointer here. Each, um, each, each, each of these inverters is, is a pair of strong um, pseudo differential conventional inverters with um, weak inverters cross-coupled to keep it 180 degrees out of phase. Anyway, if we had gone to a seven-element ring oscillator with the same tau, we would have had a higher uh, frequency, but, um, in fact, we would have doubled the frequency approximately, but we would have approximately cut the number of quantization levels in half. And, and there's a, it, it turns out that once tau is determined, there's an optimal number of, of elements you can use to, to maximize performance. And that's what we, we, we were stuck at with our earlier version. With our new version, what we did was we said, well, let's have a pair of injection locked ring oscillators, but let's injection lock them 90 degrees out of phase. And we can then even use a simpler in, uh, uh, delay element. And the point is, now we've effectively gone below the technology limit, so now our effective inverter delay is tau over two instead of tau. So we've reduced, we've, we've reduced the quantization noise floor by 6 dB. And these resistors play the role of the, um, um, of the inverters we had previously to keep things 180 degrees out of phase. Um, and, and so now we can, now we can run at 2.4 gigahertz, but still have the same number of levels ultimately. So we get a 9 dB increase in signal to quantization noise ratio relative to the first generation IC. This was our old V to I converter. I talked about it this morning. Our new V to I converter is really simple. It's basically just a pair of, of source followers running at 1.2 volts instead of 2.5. Um, the drawback of doing this, the reason we didn't do it the first time, is because it adds an enormous amount of nonlinearity. And um, before, we were relying on the op amp to linearize. Now we're going to linearize the V to I converter and ring oscillator together with these calibration sequences. It turns out this seems like an obvious thing to have done. It turns out there's a technical difficulty that we had to overcome, which is that we had to make sure, essentially, we, when we do this, we're putting our dither into a nonlinear node. After we linearize the system, our dither sees nonlinearity, and we had to work out some kinks associated with that. Anyway, but we got it to work. Um, another problem we have <coughs> is that, or had, is that there's an aliasing effect in these, in these ring oscillator uh, uh, ADCs. When we sample, we can't distinguish um, among the frequencies F, and F, F plus or minus 2 FS, and F plus or minus 4 FS, and so on. And so that means that we have to keep our, 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 our no overload range is, is um, we, we've, got, we've, got to, we've got to keep within the range 0.5 FS to 1.5 FS to stay within the, the no overload range. <clears throat> and so what happens is if we exceed that, we actually get a rollover in our measured frequency, which is, which is really bad. But we have a relatively high oversampling ratio, and so we can actually detect a rollover event. And since we know what's going to happen when we do rollover, we can fix it. And <clears throat> So we can digitally detect and correct for excursions outside this range, and we do this in the second generation to extend the no overload range. So we can effectively increase our signal to quantization noise ratio or our signal to noise ratio even further. And this is what happens when we do that correction. Then also, anytime you build something, you, 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 you get hit by problems that you never expected. And so these spurs, this is measured data from our old system. The red is before calibration, the, the, the green is after calibration. And we didn't expect these spurs. These spurs aren't very big, and, and they weren't a huge problem to us, but they're, they're definitely ugly. We don't want them there. And we, we, tra we trace this back to a memory effect in our um, ring oscillator samplers. And so this is the transmission gate flip-flop we used. And it turns out that at this node C, um, we, it, it, when you're, when you're sampling, the previous sample or information about the previous sample is, is stored in this, at this node C. And that causes this nonlinear um, uh, behavior, which gives us this harmonic distortion. 
So our solution was very simple. We just went to a, a non-transmission gate flip-flop. So, so that it, it's one of those situations where the solution was easy once you realized what the problem was. Figuring out what that problem was was, was really tough. Um, this is the performance of our first generation IC. And I won't drag you all through it. It was variable rate, so we could, we could run it. At, our low rate was 500, and our high rate was 500, 500 megahertz, and our high rate was 1.152 gigahertz. And based on how we configured it, we could get a bunch of different um, uh, figures of merit. These, these, were, these were our uh, worst case performances at, at, these, at, at these different frequencies. But the bottom line is the, the state of the art um, and, and some people are a little suspicious of this number because um, it, it hasn't been repeated before uh, since this, this thing was published. But bottom line is, is um, the state of the art figures of merit are shown here. And we didn't, I mean, depending on how you look at it, we, we didn't quite hit the state of the art. In terms of area, we beat the state of the art by a long shot. But, but in terms of, of figure of merit, there were a couple that you could argue beat, beat us. Here's our new thing. We, did, we made two versions of our, of our new system, one with the original Vita I and ICRO, current controlled ring oscillator, and one with the new one. Um, but notice that, that we, um, uh, at, with a 20 megahertz bandwidth, we're now up at a figure of merit of 165 dB and, and, um, for dynamic range. And we can also move this thing out to a 40 megahertz bandwidth, which is, is higher than any other delta sigma uh, architecture. So, um, the performance is, is um, uh, now not only state of the art in area, but but it exceeds the state of the art in um, in just raw performance in, in, on a number of different metrics in terms of delta sigma bandwidth, in terms of figure of merit. So, whoops, that was that's my conclusion. So, um, does does anybody have any questions? This was uh, work in progress that we're just reporting on as opposed to work that was finished, which, why, which is why these slides weren't quite as polished as this morning's, but hopefully they got the point across. Go ahead. Do you see the bandwidth getting larger in the future? Oh, definitely. I mean, we're, this, um, this 65 nanometer run cost me about $80,000, and, and if I'd gone to um, 40 or 45, it would have cost me about 150. So basically, this was all I could afford. And, but had we gone to smaller feature sizes, we could have really cranked up the speed and, and we, um, we could have, I mean, we're, we're, we truly are limited by how fast we can, we can push an edge through an inverter. And, and if, if, if you double that, you know, if, you, if you cut that time in half for me, I can, all of other things being the same, go twice as fast. I mean, that's, and that's actually how we went from 18 megahertz to 40 megahertz. By, by effectively just cutting that tau in half. So yeah, I, th I think when we go down to 22 um, or, or below, I mean, we can, we can really make this thing scream. Any other questions? Okay, well, let me, thank you.